Welcome to Speak Up Channel, your premier destination for immersing yourself in the world of language mastery through the magic of listening. Have you ever stopped to marvel at the incredible power of tuning into English conversations? Today, we're embarking on an exciting voyage to unlock the full potential of your language skills by embracing the art of listening. Join us as we dive headfirst into authentic dialogues and captivating talks, where every word serves as a stepping stone toward fluency. But here's the question. Just how much of the English language can you grasp when it's in action? Get ready to put your skills to the test and witness the remarkable progress you're capable of achieving. So get comfortable and prepare to be enthralled from beginning to end. Whether you're a seasoned learner or just starting out on your English journey, Speak Up Channel is here to inspire, educate, and empower you as you navigate your way toward language mastery. Let's dive in together and embark on this exhilarating adventure. Good morning. Good morning. How can I help you? I understand that the school organizes um, trips to different... Yes, we run five every month. Three during weekends and two Wednesday afternoon trips. What sort of places? Well, obviously it varies, but always places of historical interest and also which offer a variety of shopping because our students always ask about that. And then we go for ones where we know there are guided tours because this gives a good focus for the visit. Um, do you travel far? Well, we're lucky here, obviously, because we're able to say that all our visits are less than three hours' drive. How much do they cost? Oh, again, it varies. Between five and fifteen pounds a head, depending on distance. Uh-huh. Oh, and we do offer to arrange special trips if, you know, there are more than 12 people. Oh, right. I'll keep that in mind. And uh, what are the times normally? We try to keep it pretty fixed so that, that students get to know the pattern. We leave at 8.30 a.m. and return at 6 p.m. We figure it's best to keep the day fairly short. Oh, yes. And um, how do we reserve a place? You sign your name on the notice board. Do you know where it is? Uh-huh. I saw it this morning. And we do ask that you sign up three days in advance, so we know we've got enough people interested to run it, and we can cancel if necessary, with full refund, of course. That's fine. Thanks. And what visits are planned for this term? Right. Well, I'm afraid the schedule hasn't been printed out yet, but uh, we have confirmed the dates and planned the optional extra visits which you can also book in advance if you want to. Oh, that's all right. Um, if you can just give some idea of the weekend ones, so I can, you know, work out when to see friends, etc. Oh, sure. Well, uh, the first one is St Ives. That's on the 13th of February, and we'll have only 16 places available, because uh, we're going by minibus. And that's a day in town with the optional extra of visiting the Hepworth Museum. All right, yeah, that sounds good. Um, then there's a London trip on the 16th of February, and we'll be taking a medium-sized coach, so there'll be 45 places on that. And let's see, the optional extra is the Tower of London. Oh, I've already been there. Yeah. Uh, after that, there's Bristol on the 3rd of March. Where? Bristol, B-R-I-S-T-O-L. OK. That's um, in a different minibus with 18 places available. Oh, and the optional extra is a visit to the SS Great Britain. OK. We're going to Salisbury on the 18th of March. And that's always a popular one because the optional extra is Stonehenge. Ah. So we're taking the large coach with 50 seats. Oh, good. And then the last one is to Bath on the 23rd of March. Oh, yes. Is Bath the Roman city? Yes, that's right. 
And that's in the 16-seater minibus. And where's the optional visit? It's to the American Museum. Well worth a visit. OK, well, that's great. Um, thanks for all that. My pleasure. Oh, by the way, if you want more information about any of the trips, have a look in the student newspaper. OK. Or have a word with my assistant. Her name is Jane Yentob. That's Y-E-N-T-O-B. Right, I've got that. Thank you very much for all your help. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy the trips. You'll hear a tour guide giving a talk about a museum centre called Riverside Industrial Village. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Riverside Industrial Village. To start your visit, I'm just going to give you a brief account of the history of the museum before letting you roam about on your own. I won't keep you long, OK? Now, from where we're standing, you've got a good view of the river over there. And it was because of this fast-flowing water that this site was a natural place for manufacturing works. The water and the availability of raw materials in the area, like minerals and iron ore, and also the abundance of local fuels like coal and firewood, all made this site suitable for industry from a very early time. Water was the main source of power for the early industries, and some of the water wheels were first established in the 12th century, would you believe? At that time, local craftsmen first built an iron forge just behind the village here on the bend in the river. By the 17th and 18th centuries, the region's rivers supported more than 160 water mills, and many of these continued to operate well into the 19th century. But then the steam engine was invented, and then the railways came, and the centres of industry were able to move away from the rivers and the countryside and into the towns. So industrial villages like this one became very rare. So, that's the history for you. If you'd like any more information, you can ask me some questions, or you can read further in our excellent guidebook. Now, I'm going to give you a plan of the site, and I'd just like to point out where everything is, and then you can take a look at everything for yourself. I've already pointed out the river, which is on the left, and of course, running along the bottom is Woodside Road. Got it? OK, now, we're standing at the entrance. See it at the bottom? And immediately to our right is the ticket office. You won't need that, because you've got your group booking. But just past it are the toilets. Always good to know where they are. In front of us is the car park, as you can see. And to the left, by the entry gate, is the gift shop. That's where you can get copies of the guide, like this one here. Now, beyond the car park, all the buildings are arranged in a half circle with a yard in the middle. The big stone building at the top is the main workshop. That's where the furnace is and where all the metal was smelted and the tools were cast, as you'll be able to see. Now, in the top right-hand corner, that building with bigger windows is the showroom, where samples of all the tools that were made through the ages are on display. In the top left corner is the grinding shop, where the tools were sharpened and finished. And on one side of that, you can see the engine room, and on the other is the cafe, which isn't an antique, you'll be pleased to know, though they do serve very nice old-fashioned teas. The row of buildings you can see on the left are the cottages. These were built for the workers towards the end of the 18th century, and they're still furnished from that period, so you can get a good idea of ordinary people's living conditions. Across the yard from them, you can see the stables, where the horses were kept for transporting the products. And the separate building in front of them is the works office, and that still has some of the old accounts on display. Right. If anyone wants a guided tour, then I'm starting at the engine room. If you'd like to come along this way, please, ladies and gentlemen. You'll hear Melanie, a student, 
talking to one of her lecturers about her studies. Excuse me, Dr. Johnson. May I speak to you for a minute? Sure. Come in. I'm Melanie Griffin. I'm taking your course in population studies. Right. Uh, well, Melanie, how can I help you? I'm having a bit of trouble with a second assignment. Mm -hmm. And it's due in 12 days. What sort of trouble are you having? Is the assignment question a problem? Well, that's part of the problem. I'm also having... I've been having trouble getting hold of the books. I've been to the library several times and all the books are out. Sounds like you should have started borrowing books a bit earlier. Well, I had a really big assignment due in for another course and I've been spending all my time on that. And I thought... Uh, you might get an extension of time to finish your assignment for me? If that's possible. But I don't know... If... Well, yes, it is possible, but... Uh... Extensions are normally given only for medical or compassionate reasons. Otherwise, it's really a question of organizing your study. And we don't like giving extensions to students who simply didn't plan their work properly. Uh, what did you get for your first assignment? I got 87%. Hmm. Yes, you did very well, indeed. So, obviously, you can produce good work. I don't think I'll need too much extra time as long as I can get hold of some of the important references. Well, since you did so well in your first assignment, I'm prepared to give you an extra two weeks for this one. So that'll mean you'll need to submit it about a month from now. Oh, thank you. Now, what about the reading materials? Have you checked out the journal articles in the list? Um, uh, no, not yet. There were about 20 of them, and I wasn't sure which ones would be... Most useful or, or important? Well, they're all useful. But I don't expect anyone to read them all because a number of them deal with the same issues. Oh. Uh, let me give you some suggestions. The article by Anderson and Hawker is really worth reading. Right. I'll read that one. You should also read the article by Jackson. Uh, but just look at the part in the research methodology, how they did it. Okay. Jackson. Got that. And if you have time, the one by Roberts says very relevant things, although it's not essential. So, okay, if it's useful, I'll try and read that one. Now, the one by Morris. Eh, I wouldn't bother with that at this stage if I were you. Okay, I won't bother with Morris. Oh, now, someone told me the article by Cooper is important. Well, yes, in a way. But just look at the last part, where he discusses the research results. And uh, lastly, there's Forster. I can't think why I included that one. It's not bad, and could be of some help, but not that much. Now, let's deal with the assignment question. Uh, what's the problem there? It's the graph on page two. What well, seems to be the problem? It's just the bar graph showing reasons why people change where they live. Well, I've got a photocopy, but the reasons at the bottom are missing. Ah, OK. Uh, look at the first bar on the graph. Mm -hmm. Now, that indicates the number of people who move because they want more space. Oh, I see. Bar one. OK. Now, what about the next bar? Bar two is to do with the people living nearby, disturbing them. So they chose to move away to somewhere quieter. Now, let's look at bar number three. Another reason people change their place of living is because they want to be closer to the city. OK. Proximity to the city is an issue. Now, bar number four refers to problems when the owner of the property won't help fix things that go wrong. In other words, the owner is not helpful, and so the tenants move out. OK. Now, what about bar five? Uh, bar 5 is about those people who move because they need a bus or train to get them into the city or to go to work. OK. And bar 6? Bar number 6 is interesting. That reason was given quite a lot. People moving because they wanted to be in a more attractive neighbourhood. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. You'll hear a talk on the subject of the urban landscape. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. 
I have been asked today to talk to you about the urban landscape. There are two major areas that I will focus on in my talk. How vegetation can have a significant effect on urban climate and how we can better plan our cities using trees to provide a more comfortable environment for us to live in. Trees can have a significant impact on our cities. They can make a city as a whole a bit less windy or a bit more windy if that's what you want. They can make it a bit cooler if it's a hot summer day in an Australian city or they can make it a bit more humid if it's a dry inland city. On the local scale, that is in particular areas within the city, trees can make the local area more shady, cooler, more humid and much less windy. In fact, trees and planting of various kinds can be used to make city streets actually less dangerous in particular areas. How do trees do all that, you ask? Well, the main difference between a tree and a building is a tree has got an internal mechanism to keep the temperature regulated. It evaporates water through its leaves and that means that the temperature of the leaves is never very far from our own body temperature. The temperature of a building surface on a hot sunny day can easily be 20 degrees more than our temperature. Trees, on the other hand, remain cooler than buildings because they sweat. This means that they can humidify the air and cool it, a property which can be exploited to improve the local climate. Trees can also help break the force of winds. The reason that high buildings make it windier at ground level is that as the wind goes higher and higher, it goes faster and faster. When the wind hits the building, it has to go somewhere. Some of it goes over the top and some goes around the sides of the building, forcing those high-level winds down to ground level. That doesn't happen when you have trees. Trees filter the wind and considerably reduce it, preventing those very large strong gusts that you so often find around tall buildings. Another problem in built-up areas is that traffic noise is intensified by tall buildings. By planting a belt of trees at the side of the road, you can make things a little quieter, but much of the vehicle noise still goes through the trees. Trees can also help reduce the amount of noise in the surroundings, although the effect is not as large as people like to think. Low frequency noise in particular just goes through the trees as though they aren't there. Although trees can significantly improve the local climate, they do however take up a lot of space. There are root systems to consider, and branches blocking windows and so on. It may therefore be difficult to fit trees into the local landscape. There is not a great deal you can do if you have what we call a street canyon, a whole set of high-rises enclosed in a narrow street. Trees need water to grow. They also need some sunlight to grow, and you need room to put them. If you have the chance of knocking buildings down and replacing them, then suddenly you can start looking at different ways to design the streets and to introduce... Japanese housewives A hidden asset Legislators are starting to tap a dormant labour pool After graduating from college, Obora Shizue, now in her 40s, was building a solid career at an insurance firm. But after giving birth to her first child, she became a full-time mother. I wanted to keep working, but I suppressed those feelings, she says. But unlike previous generations of Japanese women, she was unwilling to stay at home. Eight years later, in 2015, she returned to work as a journalist. Ms. Obora represents a hugely important change. Female participation in Japan's labour force used to be much lower than in other big, rich countries. For decades, most women quit their jobs after giving birth to their first child. 
outdated tax and welfare systems, as well as cultural mores, underpinned this anomaly. But it is now becoming less pronounced. As Japan's labor force ages and shrinks, women are playing a growing role in it. In 2022, the employment rate for women aged 25 to 39 surpassed 80 percent for the first time since records began. Meanwhile, the percentage of households with stay at home wives fell below 30 percent, another record. A shift in cultural attitudes towards women and work underlies this change. As talent has become scarcer, working women are more prized. Japanese women's high education levels make them well placed to take advantage of the shift. 53% of women go to university in Japan, compared with 59% of men. Women are Japan's hidden assets, says Mori Masako, a former gender equality minister. But outdated family laws still serve as a barrier to women's advancement. Japanese tax and welfare policies discourage married women from working. When dependent spouses earn less than 1.3 million yen, that's $8,900 a year, they do not need to pay in to public pension and health insurance schemes. A government report published in October suggested that more than 1.1 million working women were limiting their working hours and earnings in order to stay under that threshold. The ruling Liberal Democratic Party, or LDP, is starting to take steps to tackle the issue. Last October, the government introduced subsidies and other measures to alleviate the effects of the so called income wall, which penalizes women who go over the million yen threshold. Experts reckon lawmakers will further chip away at the income wall next year, following a five yearly review of the pension system. But such policy updates alone may not be enough to entice millions of Japanese housewives back to the workplace. Oshima Yasuko of Recruit Works Institute, a research outfit, reckons a bigger shift in corporate culture is needed. In a study in 2019, she showed that among housewives who re entered the workforce, some 30% soon quit because they found it difficult to balance work schedules with child rearing and household chores. Re entering the workforce after a pause is also hard because Japanese firms tend to look with suspicion on candidates with blanks in their resume. Ms. Obora, who suffered many rejections before landing her journalism job, describes how demoralizing that can be. I used to think if I become a housewife once, I'll always be one. It would help if Japanese men and women shared their domestic burdens more equitably. In 2022, just 17% of men eligible for parental leave actually took it, compared with 80% of women. Among married couples, Japanese women spend five times more time doing chores than men. In Germany, the gap is three times. When the government speaks of gender equality, the emphasis always seems to be on making women do more, says Mochizuki Rie, a former housewife who now works in marketing. When Kishida Fumio, the Prime Minister, announced a plan last year to invest in reskilling for those on parental leave to support their transition to the workforce, many housewives complained that they were already overloaded with domestic work. I used to think that being a housewife must be easy. I couldn't have been more wrong, says Ms. Obora. Women such as her are part of a major, long overdue socio economic change. More is required from both sexes to make it go faster. We hope you have enjoyed our program. Subscribe for more helpful content and come to learn English with us 